to general obligation bonds and what the debt service would be, looking at those years that had surpluses versus those years that had deficits, taking information such as population and inflation factors and, and looking at general fund expenditures and determining whether or not are the expenditures so, so high um, how do they tie back to inflation and population? And we have some charts in this report that show just based on inflation and uh, inflation itself, um, back in 2007, 2008, general fund expenditures would be about 67 billion. If you add in population increase, which over that course of the window we looked at, population in California increased about 28 percent. So if you add inflation and population, you're up to upwards of 80, mil 80 billion dollars in expenditures. Um, but what we also point out in this report, and we made recommendations in this report related to this as well, is there are certain populations in California that have increased significantly more than the general population. The inmate population has increased 82 percent over that same window. Population of K through 12 students has increased 32 percent. And the population of Medi-Cal recipients has increased almost 100 percent. It's nearly doubled. When we looked at Medi-Cal expenditures, we saw that those expenditures, even though the population nearly doubled, the expenditures quadrupled. So we had some additional recommendations in there. We've got to look for efficiencies, et cetera. But we really saw um, some difficulties that the legislature, as, a, as an entire body, has had in enacting a budget on time and in looking at some of the constraints that the legislature has as far as the amount of funding in the budget that is constrained by state state law. I mean, 40, 40 plus percent, a lot of it's Prop 98. Another 22 percent of the budget is constrained by federal programs, federal matching programs. So there's, there's a, a fairly narrow window of um, opportunity for the legislature to make change. We have some charts in the report that show how many um, uh, what the adjustments have been in the budgets related to increasing revenue versus cutting expenditures. And we saw in many cases expenditures were cut more uh, significantly than revenue increases. There were a couple of years where revenues were increased. So we saw the constraint. We looked at the time frame and said the difficulty. Uh, we talk about both the, the uh, the need for a two-thirds for the budget as well as a two-thirds for taxes. So this is something that we had in that report. We felt it was important to put out there. But again, we wouldn't expect this is something absolutely the entire legislature has to be engaged in this process and determine whether or not this is a recommendation that makes sense or if it's a recommendation that you don't think makes sense, then it's not something that the legislature would, would pursue. I think given the fact that, and you've really done the taxpayers a service by identifying in one example in one of these areas, an expenditure of $580 million for a building in that the Department of Corrections was leasing that we don't even need. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a half a billion dollars. So given that you've uncovered that, I, I would say that, that that's a path we need to pursue much more rigorously before we ever go to the taxpayers and say, gee, we, we need more money because I think this is one more example of um, an area where we haven't even gotten to the low-hanging fruit. So I, I commend you for uncovering that. I just was um, a little taken off, mm -hmm. taken aback by this recommendation, but thank you. Appreciate your comments. Thank you, Johnny. Mr. Dun Senator Dutton, sorry. Yeah, uh, when you were taking a look at the Prop 13 issue, did you also take a look at the practice of doing mellow roofs districts, the special assessment districts, and uh, Prop 218 and everything that comes about because it, 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 you can't just take Prop 13. There's a lot of other things that also were put into play uh, that serve as an equalizer as far as providing services. Uh, and so I was just curious if you looked at that at all. The, the analysis in this high risk report, my understanding, I'm just reading from, uh, doesn't, it doesn't address Prop 13, does it? Because that's property tax. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, maybe so I misunderstood what I was. So we, we weren't referring. Well, reducing to the two thirds vote requirement down to right. 50%. I'm sorry, I didn't mean right. Prop 13. Okay. I meant reducing the uh, deal because they also have assessment districts and other things that have, haven't had any trouble being formed. So. Mm -hmm. No, Senator, we didn't get into that kind of okay. detail when we conducted no. our, our high risk analysis. The two thirds vote requirement, that's quite a history here in California as to requiring sure. a two thirds vote. Did you actually go back? to the history of, of how the two-thirds vote requirement on raising taxes and passing budgets and, and so forth, how that actually historically for California, because it's 
it's been a quite a quite a history, quite a ride with that. No, again, we, we did not go back and look at the legislative history as far as okay. we looked at, we were doing an analysis of revenues, expenditures, okay. trying to break down the budget into areas where the legislature's really constrained by either state requirements or, or federal matching requirements. So no, we did not. At, that. Uh, do you take a look at the work of the Little Hoover Commission uh, as far as what they've done in the way of things that they've looked at? Uh, with regard to I mean, we, we, well, we look at Little Hoover reports all the time okay. um, as far as anything related to this, the two-thirds vote. If, if, is that no, your specific I'm question? I'm going to go we, certainly, general, we certainly look at Little general, Hoover reports. Because you've uh, been looking at compliance, and, and, and now it sounds like you're getting into looking at cost savings type things mm -hmm. and so forth. Little mm -hmm. Hoover's done some work in that. We came across a report, I think it was 1995 or 1996, uh, when they made a recommendation to amend the Constitution uh, with regards to the civil service status mm -hmm. to allow for the contracting out with the private sector for some services. Have you ever mm -hmm. taken a look at that? We've looked at contracting out for certain services um, on individual audits. We did an audit a couple of years ago related to um, IT services and, and whether or not state agencies contract out for that um, and what the, what the requirements are under state law as far as if you have a state employee that has the ability to do that work, then you need to, to f avail yourself of the state employee. But if you don't, then you can certainly contract out for those particular services. So we've done not a wholesale analysis of that, Senator, but we have done it um, on an audit by audit basis. Maybe what I'll do then, I'll make a copy of the specific sure. finding that I'm referring to that from back in the 1990s, because we were going through a recession back then and Little Hoover got involved in coming up with a series of recommendations on how we could uh, be more cost effective in delivering sure. services. Uh, and so I'll be, I'll, I'll go over that with you on, the, on that. Um, well, I guess I'm getting old. I can't remember what the other item was. <laughs> I'll let it go. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and just to follow up, my understanding is the framing on this issue of the two-thirds threshold versus something lower, 55% majority vote. You were looking at that strictly through the lens of added cost to the state when a budget is not uh, achieved on time. Is, is that that's fair? That's true. Uh, that's absolutely fair. We talk about that in this high risk report as well as, as what the implications are for the state of California. As we historically have had late budgets, it affects our bond uh, rating, it affects cost to vendors that we can't pay. Um, a lot of the different imp implications of continually having late budgets year after year after year and, and certainly the analysis of comparing expenditures to revenues coming in, the constraints. This report, um, we really hoped it would serve as a good tool for people to kind of get a handle. Um, and we've received positive feedback from members of the legislature on this particular report uh, as far as bringing all, of the, all okay. of the different issues together. Right, and that's, I think, the utility of it because in the ongoing budget crisis and the delayed budgets, we often hear of a particular area of bond ratings or freezing bond sales or things like that, but I don't think since I've been here we've ever seen kind of an aggregation of when you add up those costs, mm -hmm. uh, how those impact the state and eventually cost us more. And some of those are not tangible kind of budget line costs, uh, but, but more speculative in terms of how is Calif how are California businesses affected when bond ratings uh, go go down. So uh, so I appreciate that being highlighted as just part of the diagnosis of the overall health of, of California's budget. So thank you. Thank you. Great. And are there any further questions? Thank you, Ms. Howe. At this time, I would like to invite uh, public comment. Mr. Chairman, members, David Wolf here with the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, and uh, the timing was good because I did want to speak on issue 14, the lowering of the uh, two-thirds vote for local taxes. Uh, first of all, I did want to uh, reference a couple of points uh, as it regards the budget situation. Yes, the budget situation is serious, but we don't believe that it is an excuse to raise taxes. The LAO a couple of months ago managed to come out with a budget that included no new taxes. So it's clear that our budget difficulties can be fixed without raising them. And number two, 
Um, just regarding Ms. Howell's point, um, with a spending cap, it's worth noting that if the GAN spending limit, which was passed in the early 1980s, had remained in effect and not been essentially gutted by Prop 98 and Prop 111, um, the general fund savings over the course of that 30 plus years would be $40 billion. And again, it's just worth making the point that um, we have a severe spending problem in the state of California and not a revenue problem. Um, so just by way of introduction, I wanted to make those points. And I also wanted to thank Ms. Howell for a number of very, as Ms. Mr. Donnelly alluded to as well, a number of very strong and positive recommendations here that will save California taxpayers millions, if not billions of dollars and streamline government. It's important when we're facing a $26 billion budget deficit um, to work hard to streamline government without cutting essential programs. And I think, Ms. Hal, your efforts here today and the efforts of the uh, auditor go a long way to uh, ensuring that happens. Um, unfortunately, though, this item in particular does represent a direct assault on Prop 13, and I did want to speak on that just briefly. As you know, Prop 13 requires a two-thirds vote for local special taxes and um, bonds outside of education facility bonds. Um, Californians have made it very clear, um, including in recent history, just a couple of years ago, the PPIC came out with a poll that showed 62% support for Proposition 13. And again, that's the PPIC, which is far from a conservative polling organization um, that still polled Prop 13 at about the same levels that it passed back in 1978. Very strong. Um, again, second point, taxes are already high. We have the highest income <coughs> sales and the highest corporate tax on the West Coast currently. And lowering the threshold for bonds and special taxes will simply increase uh, property taxes beyond Prop 13's 1% cap and make it harder for individuals to stay in their homes in the middle of the worst recession and one of the worst housing markets since the, uh, since the Great Depression. It's worth noting too, people often think that, ooh, because of Prop 13, we have one of the lowest property tax rates in the country. And that's simply not true and a lot of that has to do precisely with lowering the threshold and the passage of bonds and special taxes on the local level. Um, according to the Tax Foundation, when they combine state and local per capita property taxes, California is actually 22nd, the middle of the pack, in terms of the amount of property taxes that are paid. Um, so clearly, especially when you consider you know, the, the other broad-based taxes being in the top 10, we don't believe this is an appropriate justification um, to increase property taxes. And that's all. We just want to thank, again, the auditor for her recommendations, and thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Please come forward to the microphone. You can come to the side. Hello, uh, my name is Alfonso Ramirez. I'm a retired state employee. I worked for the state for several years. Um, I worked in human resources. One of the recommendations that Ms. Howell made in um, her recommendations to the, to the governor was the uh, issue about uh, retired annuitants. And uh, you know, I appreciate you uh, for putting that uh, on the uh, proposal to um, Governor Brown. I did meet with your staff, uh, Ms. Uh, Margarita Fernandez and also Stephen Russo, uh, and it's specifically about uh, the career executive assignment positions. Uh, when a state employee retires as a CEA, uh, what, the, uh, what the departments have done on a regular basis is, is brought them back and paid them CEA pay, although they have not been in an approved CEA position. Uh, DPA uh, has had uh, policies since 1999 prohibiting that, and DPA has not com made uh, departments comply with that policy. So over the last 10 or 12 years, um, there's been thousands of uh, in individuals that have come back into state civil service and have not been in approved CEA positions. and 
the net result is that they've made hundreds of thousands of dollars more than they should be receiving as um, as retired annuitants. And that goes back into the uh, the first point in that recommendation is that um, the state needs to do a, an audit of the entire retired annuitant program to make sure that retired annuitants are actually performing the duties, the appropriate duties uh, uh, according to the um, the class specifications that they fill as retired annuitants, um, so I you know I like to bring that up, and uh, again I appreciate Ms. Howell for following up on my my recommendation when I met with her staff and putting it into the the recommendations they uh, presented to Governor Brown. Great, thank you so much. Appreciate your comments. Anybody else? Great, thank you so much. I'd like to thank Ms. Howell for providing these valuable reports. Um, you know, as she highlighted, there are several opportunities for us to continue to save money um, and increase efficiency in our state. So uh, the committee will continue to work with you and your staff um, and uh, continue to monitor the progress. Thank you so much to the members of the committee for participating today. Uh, seeing no more comments or questions, that concludes today's oversight hearing. Thank you.